Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are continuing this evening the three lecture unit on oral presentation. And tonight we have the pleasure of hearing the first of uh, several people who have been courageous enough and good enough to volunteer to give us actual working demonstrations. Your function this evening, let me say, is to listen attentively to these uh, presentations and try and estimate them as they proceed. Try and judge them. And I would suggest you try to focus in part on the content and in part on the method of presentation. In regard to the content, you should be concerned with questions like, Essentially, is this true? Is there something basically confused about the viewpoint being presented? Is it riddled with non sequiturs or illogical connections? Is there some vital, crucial point that is being omitted uh, by the speaker? That's what I would call typical questions pertaining to the content. In essence, it comes down to, does this make sense as basic uh, a philosophic viewpoint. But also partly, of course, from the aspect of this course, even more primarily, I would like you to focus on the method of presentation. And I'm using that in the broadest sense to encompass not simply the narrow techniques of oral uh, delivery, although that's included, but all the kinds of points that I've been making since uh, the course began the co-epistemology and uh, the nature of an audience's context all the way down. Now, I am not going to, even by way of review, itemize the main points that you should be looking for presentationally, primarily because if I were about to deliver a talk and the speaker before me gave, s I happen to have, for instance, a checklist of 16 items of presentation, <laughs> That would finish me if the preceding speaker did that, so I'm not going to do that to our speakers this evening, but you should know the points from our earlier uh, discussion. Now, you obviously can't keep track of all of those points and all of the issues of content. You will necessarily have the feeling of being on a speeding express train. You're going to want the speaker to stop all the time so you can get down, if you're being active about this, your thoughts on the method and your thoughts on the content. You're going to get hopelessly behind, but that is natural. Get what you can. The one thing is this. You should not be bored no matter what uh, happens because you are working during this presentation. And if for some reason your interest is not held, that should stimulate you immediately to try to figure out what is it uh, that is being done that is making me not uh, be interested. Take notes, not so much notes of the content, but notes of whatever kind of observations you have on either of the main divisions, and try and reach an estimate by the conclusion of the talk. Essentially, one of three estimates. Basically, you think this is good, even if you have reservations, doubts, questions. Basically, you think this is bad, even if you think there are some better points to it, or basically you think this is mixed. There's such a significant element of the good and the bad that you just wouldn't be able to go one way or the other. And I will try to see what you think uh, uh, when the presentation is over. After the speaker is finished, we will take a few minutes of silence. Uh, for you to gather and organize your thoughts, look over your notes, pick out what you think is the most striking of your comments, and for me to do the same thing. And then we will together make our comments and see what we can learn by way of application. One uh, reminder, uh, as I say, this is a very difficult thing on the part of the volunteers to face an audience of this size. Some of them have never spoken in public uh, before. It is a very courageous thing, and uh, I would like uh, on your part any comments that you do make, however much you may uh, express a negative estimate in content, to be as uh, warm, uh, friendly, uh, courteous, uh, 
as you can possibly make it because uh, this is a very difficult thing that is being undertaken and it would be very unfair uh, uh, not to take that fully into account. Now, I, I've given all the speakers a limit of about 10 minutes uh, within a minute or two, so they may not, they understand that they may not finish because after all they're taking on mammoth topics, which you could go on for an hour or two hours or five hours. It really is as a sample of extemporaneous presentation that we wanted. So I may, uh, even though they're still in the middle, say, okay, that's enough for our purposes. The 10 minutes is passed, and you can stop at this point, and we'll analyze where we've gotten to with no hard feelings on either side, since it is just an exercise. Now, our first volunteer is Ms. Vandenberg, seated here. And her topic is, if I'm correct, effective child rearing. Uh, and she is going to be presenting this as though to an audience of parents at a uh, parent-teacher's meeting at a private school. Is that correct? So I'll uh, give Ms. Vandenberg a moment to come up, and we'll hear her presentation. Thank you. All right, can you hear me? All right, I'd like you to imagine your parents at a PTA meeting in either a Montessori, a public, or a private school. The topic tonight is an effective approach to child rearing. How many of you would expect an 80-story skyscraper to be constructed without using a blueprint prepared by an architect or without organized human effort provided by skilled construction workers? While few of you would expect a skyscraper to result without rational human effort, many of you do expect your child to develop into a mature, rational adult without your having to use a systematic approach or possessing the skills or methods necessary to assist your child's development. The role of an architect is to develop a blueprint, to guide construction, and to see that there is an orderly, step-by-step -step process beginning with a foundation and going into a framework, and eventually a skyscraper is built. The role of an adult is to supervise a child's development. The adult should possess a blueprint. That is, he should be aware of the goal and the direction and the steps involved in a child's development. He should understand what are the qualities an independent adult possesses and how are these developed. Then he should have the skills and the methods necessary to help the child develop these qualities. And finally, he should use a systematic approach to enable the child to develop a broad foundation and a sturdy framework during the childhood years. Tonight's topic is to look at what a systematic or an effective approach to child rearing is. And we're going to note that it involves four ingredients. These four ingredients are, it should be an objective approach, a rational approach, an individual approach, and an integrated approach. By an objective approach to child rearing, I mean child rearing must look to the facts of reality and observe children to discover the nature and needs of children and to identify the exact steps in a child's development. The adult should be aware of the goal, the direction, and the process involved in self-development. By sticking to the facts of reality, you then will be able to develop realistic guidelines, expectations, and rules so that you'll know what the child can do and when he can be expected to do it. And you will not be expecting or demanding the impossible or neglecting aspects of his development or expecting too little. By using realistic guidelines and objective rules, you will find that you will be treating the child in a just and fair manner. The child will soon see that the rules, the same rules and needs and laws apply to everyone, not just to him. Secondly, if an effective approach to child rearing should be a rational approach. Child rearing must involve the use, the use of reason to develop the understandings of what child development involves. You have to also use reason to apply these understandings to your particular child. The adult 
involved should trust his mind and trust his ability to think for himself when applying these principles to your particular child. Using a rational approach involves treating the child in a rational manner, not telling the child, do this because I say so or else, but rather taking the time to explain to the child, this is what I want you to do, this is why I want you to do it, this is how you are to do it, and this is when I expect you to do it. And finally, a rational approach to child rearing is an approach that will help the child to become a rational person. This involves starting with the child when he is young to do all you can to help him to understand reality. Eventually, the child will realize that reality is knowable, it's orderly, and it's predictable. The child should be able to develop a trust in his ability to learn and trust his ability to think. And we can do this by actually instructing the child in how to think. This would involve helping a child learn how to make decisions, how to solve problems, what's involved in formulating your goals and how to go about achieving them. It also involves introducing the child to logic, helping the child to develop a code of values that he can use to guide his actions, and eventually helping the child to develop a philosophy that will guide his life. Aside from using an objective and a rational approach, you must use an individual approach to child rearing. Child rearing is concerned with the self-development of individual children. Now this involves accepting and treating your child as the individual he is. Each child is unique. They're entitled to their own thoughts, their own feelings, their own interests, and their own needs. It involves comparing the child to himself and his development, not to others. And it also involves helping the child to understand himself as the unique individual he is, so that he will become aware of himself as a valuable person, as a person competent in certain areas, and as a person able to develop competency in other areas. And finally, the child will realize that he possesses a potential for human greatness, that we are there to help him explore and to develop. Finally, an effective approach to child rearing is an integrated approach, rather than a fragmented, haphazard, hit or miss approach. We are dealing with a whole child, and all these different aspects of child development are related and integrated. We can achieve an integrated approach to child rearing by using the child's life as the standard to which we relate all we are doing, all that we expect the child to do, and all that he does, so that he will see that everything he does is related to his needs, his interests, and his goals. He will see that certain of his actions are either going to help him grow and develop and to achieve his goals, or that other actions will not help him grow and develop, and they will hinder him from achieving his goals. An integrated approach to child rearing will let the child know that he has an active role in his self-development. He's basically a self-made individual. Our role is just there to guide him in his self-development. He'll realize that he is responsible for all he does, all he becomes in life. Now, in summary, we discussed three points tonight. The first was the importance of using an effective approach to child rearing. Secondly, we looked at the role of an adult in such an approach, and we found the adult should possess an awareness of the goals and the steps of human development. They should possess certain skills and methods and use a systematic approach in guiding the child's development. And third, we looked at what this systematic approach would be, and we found that it would be an objective approach based on the nature and the needs of a child, a rational approach involving the use of reason in dealing with a child, an individual approach based on the self-development of your child, and an integrated approach which uses your child's life as a standard to relate all of his actions to. Just as it is up to an architect to supervise the entire process of constructing a skyscraper, 
It is up to you, the parent, to supervise your child's development. By using an effective approach to child rearing, you will help your child construct a foundation and a framework that will enable him to achieve his life's goals and his individual greatness. Thank you. Well, I want to thank Ms. Vandenberg. That's an excellent demonstration at the outset because it definitely has virtues and it also has certain problems in the presentation. I want to give you a couple of minutes now to make a list of each. As far as you can tell, both content and uh, method of presentation, uh, that's a perfect uh, start. Uh, it's very effective and it's very good for what we want. So let's just take a couple minutes here and try to get our thoughts in order. All right, have you got uh, an overall estimate? I just realized in saying what I said originally, I more or less gave my estimate, but that's okay <laughs> because uh, you can feel free to disagree. Uh, taking the three estimates, how many would say that is essentially good? Well, we've got a very good, you've got a uh, very favorable audience because a great majority thought that was essentially good. How many would say to go to the other extreme that it's essentially negative? You only have, a, about, I think, one or two people that I can see. And how many would say that that's essentially mixed? That is a fairly distant second. So in terms of uh, the poll of the class, uh, uh, you did very well. I myself would incline more somewhat to the mixed than to the uh, positive, but there were a lot of positives, so I won't, I wouldn't classify that necessarily as a disagreement uh, with the class. It depends what you emphasize. You did certain things extremely well. And if, uh, if you're, uh, you know, sufficiently enthusiastic about the things you did well, then you wouldn't pay as much attention to the others. <laughs> I'm being paid here largely to show what you didn't do as well, so <laughs> you have to take that into account. So we won't argue about that. Let us first of all establish what was it that was done well in this, as uh, let's list some positives at the outset. Yes, very organized presentation, and that is always a pleasure to hear. You, the audience always relaxes, I know I do, when you say we're going to cover this subject, I have four points, number one, two, three, four, and now here is my review, and you explain to them why you're going to cover it, cover each one, then you summarize it at the end, so we know where you are. It's easy to take notes within certain limits, which I'll come in on in a moment, but uh, we know where you are, and it's definitely on the point of structure, leaving aside now any questions about the content, uh, on the point of organization, it's, it's easy to follow and straightforward. That's certainly one point. What else is good about this? Yes. You say good, strong opening, a concrete example. Uh, an ex do you mean an example? You mean an analogy, an right? Analogy. In other words, the reference to architecture, the skyscraper, and the blueprint. Uh, and therefore, that comes under what general? Uh, um, why is that strong? What is it that she's doing in that opening? Motivating. She's motivating the audience. So she's giving them an analogy, something that they understand. Uh, there is such a field as... Uh, uh, architecture, and uh, that requires a certain kind of knowledge and approach, and she's going to do the same thing to building the character of the uh, children. And uh, that is an analogy, but it's a very apt uh, analogy, and an audience can get it, and it's a good analogy even for a completely raw audience, because even if they know nothing, it invokes in them the idea, well, obviously you have to do something to produce a certain kind of effect, and there is a certain way in which I'm forming my child the way you would form uh, a skyscraper, and therefore it per se doesn't necessarily convince them, but no opening is going to convince them. It might intrigue them and may give them a motivating framework. So I would say yes, very good with regard to um, uh, motivation. What else? Yes. Yes, I put down loud. 
And I like the fact that she started by saying, do you hear me? That is a, is a good thing because uh, it's urgent that you be able to be heard. And therefore, if by the sheer act of starting that way, an audience thinks, oh, she's not going to drone on. She is aware uh, that we have to hear her. And she's asking, can you hear me? So it's a forthright opening. And that would be many speeches very highly improved if the first words were, can you hear me? <laughs> so uh, I, I regard as a definite virtue that it was loud and unequivocal. It wasn't prissy, and she didn't whisper the words or drop them. Uh, you could definitely hear them. What else was good about this? Yes. You say important points were emphasized. I'm not sure I agree with you there. I have some questions about emphasis. Would you like to elaborate where you thought they were emphasized or in what form they were emphasized? Oh, I see. You, the, the titles of her various sections, objective, rational, individual, and integrated, were a little louder and uh, uh, set apart from the content. Yes, you d in that sense, emphasis was appropriate, was correct. You could tell that there are four main concepts <laughs> operating here. I have questions about, though, emphasis in, in another way, but let's leave that for the moment. You're correct as far as that goes. That reduces what you're saying, really, to that she made her structure uh, clear to you. That's correct. What else is good uh, about this uh, presentation? Now, you say she maintained eye contact. I realize that where I'm seated, I couldn't tell. So beside uh, the, my checklist where it says monitoring audience, I couldn't tell if she was doing it or not. Her eyes seemed to be fairly stationary from the viewpoint that I had. Did you feel that you were being looked at and being paid attention to, or did you feel that she was primarily focused on her preset speech and not paying attention to you? Did, by a show of hands, how many had the impression that she was actually maintaining her awareness on you? And how many had the impression that the greater awareness was on her note? Well, I think the majority think the latter, and that was my impression on the side, but I realized I couldn't see your eyes, your hair to cut off your eyes from the, uh, the, <laughs> the position I'm in, not, not, you know, but um, <laughs> I did, I did think that uh, you could have done with less reliance on the notes. Uh, uh, I, d I did have the impression that you were, you had over-prepared this, that this was not completely extemporaneous in, in the ideal way. And that while you didn't have it all written out, uh, may I ask you, did you uh, deliver this like to a mirror or to an audience at home intact? Mm -hmm. A mirror, completely. Yeah. Uh, how many times? <laughs> Would you say five times? Um, more than five, yeah. Three. Oh, well, uh, that's okay. You had many rewrites of it. I understand that. But there definitely was an impression of this uh, in the presentation that that came across, you see. If you're going to do that with a talk, that uh, you are going to go over it so many times that you effectively commit it to memory, then you have to counteract that with some kind of techniques that will give the audience the impression that this is extemporaneous. But in your case, see, what you never did is stumble. You never pause to grasp the word as I'm just doing. Uh, you never gave the impression that you were thinking of it as you were presenting it. You see, now the ideal extemporaneous delivery, you don't want to pause so often that <laughs> the audience is lost, but you don't want to just zip through it as though the audience wants to feel you are getting to it as they're getting to it. And you definitely communicated uh, that you had rehearsed this thoroughly and that you knew exactly what you were going to say when, and you just went mode right on. And therefore, the, there was some eye contact with the audience, but no one, at least I did not have the impression that if they had frowned, that would have stopped you in your tracks and made you add something. You had your eye on the notes and the time, and you were going to make it to the end, <laughs> and you were just kind of looking at them with the idea, well, you give them a sop. Isn't that in effect 
correct, and that came across, you see. So that's very understandable if you're nervous, but the best way around that is actually to jump in at some point and simply lecture to an audience without it being that prepared. Have more fragmented notes and take advantage if your mind goes blank. You know, you're in the middle of uh, objectivity and you don't have it prepared and you look at your notes and it says objectivity parenthesis explained. And <laughs> <laughs> you can't think what the explanation is, you went blank. And you can rescue, you can make an asset of that, you know, by saying, now the next point we want to cover is uh, the role of objectivity in child rearing. What do you think that would consist of? <laughs> you know? And that is actually helpful because if you need to pause, the chances are they need to pause. Now true, in the act of doing that, you're losing time. So you have to make a mental note, well, goodbye to integration then. It's <laughs> going to be three points, not four points, but then at least then someone from the audience will say, oh, objectivity, that has to do with uh, the facts rather than emotions. And then that might, if you get somebody, you know, that's approximately on the track, and then you might say that jogged your memory, you see. Meanwhile, you've also had them participate a bit, and you've slowed it down a bit. Now, you have to risk something for this. Uh, in other words, if you want the true extemporaneous quality, you have to go up with just a few words with the idea, if you go blank, you're going to have to think on the spot, but it's correspondingly a more effective presentation than just rattling uh, right through it. That was one of my criticisms uh, of the presentation. However, the positive side of that is you were terrific with regard to timing, <laughs> because you came out to the minute, so, uh, uh, but ideally you would come out uh, to the minute, but do it in the context of also an extemporaneous uh, uh, talk. What else? Uh, I think the main virtues uh, um, uh, have been uh, covered. Oh, I wanted to add as another virtue repetition. I, I like the fact that you State in advance what you're going to do. That was the classic three-part three lecture. I'm going to cover these four points. Here are the four points. I have covered these four points. And that's always, you know, a perfectly valid way of uh, 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 giving a talk. And the repetition uh, is helpful, so you were okay on that. Your transitions were clear. You said, now let's go to the next point. Uh, that was fine. Um, there's another point that I didn't, uh, I don't believe I lectured on, but which you passed, and that is there was no rhetoric in your talk. By rhetoric, I mean in this context, not the ancient Greek sense of the term, but empty verbiage. That is, you didn't, uh, uh, you know the way politicians speak is the best example, where they go on and on, and it's not simply that it's a floating abstraction, whichever, they're not saying anything at all, they're just clacking their uppers, <laughs> so to speak. There was none of that. Yours was condensed, it was taught, you had a, your points and what you wanted to say and you just kept pouring the material out. So you were fine on that point. Now, however, there were some points where I think it could be improved. Now, whether you thought that uh, there were problems with it or not, who would say that there were some aspects uh, where this talk uh, could be improved and if so, what sort of points. Mr. Torres, yes. Now let me repeat that so everyone can hear. Uh, you think that it was too abstract, you kept waiting for it to cover specific issues and problems that would arise in the home and in daily life so you could see what this amounts to. Now this is a very important criticism mm -hmm. with which I agree. And uh, this is the essential reason why I would regard this talk as mixed, because I do not believe that an, an audience could uh, take it in. It's organized, you definitely motivated them, but you pitched it on a level of such abstractness that it's questionable to me how much an outside audience, that is one who doesn't already know objectivity, rationality, integration and all these complex philosophic concepts, how much would they get out of it? Now, for instance, I tried to put myself into 
uh, the framework of that type of audience. And I started your first one, and you, this is my own, now I'm not a fast writer, but I did get through many years of college. And uh, <laughs> I could not take down your definitions. You, you went through them, you zipped through them, so uh, you didn't pause after them, and you didn't give us time to digest them or illustrate them, and consequently I had the experience as though you were in effect giving a definition and then in a generalized way saying why it would be helpful rather than actually concretizing it. Now let's take for instance some objectivity. You said, if I'm correct, I wrote down beside my notes here, facts of reality dash too fast. <laughs> meaning I couldn't keep up with it, it was gone. You said something about it's ki ta uh, um, make reference to the facts of reality or take account of the facts of reality. Do you want to just repeat now what your actual definition was of objectivity in this context? Look to the facts of reality. Look to the facts of reality. Observe and the children. Yes. Now, all of that is in the definition. Let me repeat that again. You said, look to the facts of reality, observe the nature and needs of the children in order to identify the exact steps required for their proper development. That's your definition. What is your actual definition? Because you see that on the face of it, that definition is too unwieldy to be graspable. What would be your actual definition that you'd want the audience to, to grasp? To look to uh, facts of reality. Right. Well, you say, the, by objectivity you mean look to the facts of reality and of children in order to determine the proper approach. That's the essential concept, right? Now, that, you would have to understand, of course, is a very abstract, very, very abstract, because what facts of reality and what facts about children? And what would be a contrasting policy? Now, you see, if you wanted to make this clear, you would have to do two things to an out beginning audience. They do not know what is the alternative to looking to the facts of reality, nor even necessarily what you mean by the facts of reality. Sometimes they might take by reality, you mean some super dimension uh, beyond us. Or what facts about children? Do you mean, for instance, my child doesn't want to go to bed and that's a fact and therefore I should respect it whether or not it's the right time. You see, you've got a vast chaos in the audience's mind about such a term as objectivity. To simply say, look to the facts of reality and of the children to know what to do, per se, is too abstract. Now, it's okay to say you have to look to the facts of reality, but what are then you have to do? Give a contrast and give a concrete example. Now, what would be, what is the real point you want to make here? Presumably, you mean look to the facts of reality as against your arbitrary emotions. Is that what you meant? As opposed to acting arbitrarily. Yeah. Well, if you, if you put it that way, then what you really meant to convey to them is look to the facts of reality as opposed to merely acting arbitrarily. What question will then be in the audience's mind if they're following your structure? Now, you started by saying what? <laughs> it's very important that you approach this systematically that you have a structure, that you organize, you know what you're doing and have a reason for what you're doing. Now you're saying, here's the content of my approach, and number one is, don't be arbitrary. Well, to an audience, that sounds like what? Yes. Yeah. Now, are you going to answer my point, or are you on your own point? <laughs> no, you're on your own point. Give me one second. What, what, what does it sound like to an audience if uh, you, f you say as your point one, don't be arbitrary. No, it sounds like you're repeating in a generalized way your introduction. If your overall introduction is we got to have an organization, we got to have a system, we can't just, you know, do this helter-skelter, it's like the building. Then when you come to point one, it has to be something more specific than don't be arbitrary, you see, because it sounds like just over again what you said at the beginning. So what do you have to be more specific? Now, I'm not going to write the thing for you, but the idea, for instance, might be you come in and you say, you made a promise to your child that he could see this movie, and now Saturday morning comes and you don't feel 
like taking him. But there's no good reason that you could think of. You just don't feel like it. So you tell him, I don't feel like it, and you're not going to go. Then you could say, that's a case of putting your emotion above the facts. You made a certain promise. You led him to believe reality would be a certain way, that this would be the fact. He counted on it, and now you're letting your emotion override it. Now, I don't say this is a brilliant or intriguing example. I just you know, did it on the spot. But it bring, pins it down, you see. You know what in pattern the person is talking about as against what, and how would it come up in daily life? Now, you need a couple of that. The more homey, the better, because the more abstract your abstraction, the more familiar and daily must be uh, the concrete. On ideal, you'd want to give several concrete. One to say, you see, I don't mean anything frightening. I mean something really daily that you can understand. And then after they get it, another concrete more intriguing. So they get the idea, gee, I've been inconsistent. I see that there's a broader issue here uh, that I haven't thought about, you see. But you didn't give us that. Um, that's what's sometimes called chewing an abstraction. That is putting it before an audience and saying, I mean this, I don't mean that. Here would be a simple example. Here's a more you know, important example. Uh, this is how I differentiate it from this point. And at a certain point, it takes in an audience's mind, you see. But now, obviously, to do that, you have to hit a certain pace. If you have 10 minutes, one of the four is all you could really do that with, given a beginning and an end. But it's interesting that you attempted to do the four, you see, because it shows you that you're, you're put in that position throughout. Everyone had to, by the nature of, you had what? C not counting your introduction and your wrap-up, you had about two minutes a shot of which about 20 seconds would be just uttering your abstract definition. So you have a minute and 40 seconds. And you just can't do it, you know. It's just impossible. So you could be the, the, the greatest genius of presentation in the world that couldn't be done in that space. So I'm simply indicating to you what uh, type of thing uh, you'd have to do. This same problem uh, uh, of not concretizing ran really throughout all four of them. Now, when I got to rationality, the important thing when you give us points is we have to know what's the difference between the points. You cannot say there's three points to this talk. Point one and then point two sounds like a... Well, how does that differ from point one? Now, how does rationality, uh, even in your special context, differ from objectivity? You, if I remember, you said objectivity, uh, rationality in this case means going by reason. Uh, how does that differ from accepting the facts of reality, which was the, uh, the, the operative definition of objectivity in the uh, first uh, one? Now, what would you actually say about that? What is the actual point that you had to make that differs from objectivity? Well, that's, that's not a, a, a too clear a distinction as you word it. You say objectivity would be looking at the facts about the child mm -hmm. and putting them to use and so on. And reason would be trying to understand them mm -hmm. but, and use them. But that's a, not much of a distinction because what's the use of looking at them if you don't use them? And how can you use them without looking at them? So really, it's the same one point. And actually, as you know philosophically, objectivity is an aspect of which rationality of reason. So if you were going to do this in a way now, we're more on content now, but if you were going to do this in such a way as to keep your points distinguished, uh, then I would suggest that the key point here is rationality, which you would first define. And then when you got to objectivity, you would say, now this is an application. Uh, this is one form of rationality, and it arises in this type of context. And then the same would be true of your other uh, points, you see. But, um, and it's okay to have four points and say, first is my broad point, second is an application. But always remember that your structure won't hold if your audience doesn't see the interrelation of the points. And because you were forced to be so abstract, 
the points kept falling, particularly point one and two, and I may say point four uh, uh, also in my mind wasn't too clear. This was the issue of um, uh, the integrate. Now, you never mentioned a word about that until you got to the end of the talk. Now, you, here's an issue of objectivity of formulation. You did obviously did not mean racial balance or anything of that kind, but you know the contemporary audience will hear the word integrate as not having anything to do with mental processes and so on. They'll have it to do with the ratio of minorities to and so on. So, uh, if you don't want to set up an expectation that you don't uh, intend, and therefore that would not be too good a word, maybe uh, organized or interconnected or systematic or whatever the term is, but um, uh, uh, in this connection, it simply just throws them off by the way the term is commonly used. But even so, when we did get to integrate it, again, I was not clear. You said as, as against being fragmented or hit or miss. But that was, again, the same issue that you said in your introduction, namely what? We want a systematic approach. But then you see you can't have a systematic approach and then have one of the elements of the system be over again. It has to be systematic, you see. Now, you actually, I believe, meant something more specific by integrated here, just as you meant something more specific by objective. But you didn't have a chance because of the generality of your uh, definitions and your discussion to make it clear. Now, what would you specifically have meant by integrated here in a way that differentiates it from merely, let's have an overall system or let's be objective and so on? What did you specifically mean by integrated? Now, you went into the child's life in your elaboration should be the standard and everything should be related to that. And that will show him uh, that he is uh, self-made and uh, he's responsible. But I didn't get the connections there. What, how does that material connect to it should be integrated? Your approach should be integrated. Now, maybe you just went too fast for me to keep up to that, but how do yeah. Just let me repeat so people can hear. You say usually people separate different aspects. They send them to school and that's schooling, and then they send them what to church and that's religion. And they send them to a social club and so on. Yes, okay. And you say was well, everything has to be interconnected. Well, you see, even that much would have been more helpful if you'd said even that much. You didn't give us any contrast if you said by integrated I mean. Every aspect of the child's life has to be seen by you as part of one systematic plan. Now I include his homework, his dancing, his piano lessons, his parties, his movies, etc. Then you say, for instance, some parents tell their child, "Be uh, uh, do your best," and then uh, they they tell him, "Oh, it's okay to cheat," and then they give him this contradiction in another realm, and so on. You say that's going to ruin him. What I say is, you have to have one consistent approach. It's really consistency then you're talking about. And then you could say, now, but what will unite all these things? How will you know what to do to be consistent? Then the audience says, well, I guess you need something to guide you. Then you say, well, you decide according to. You have a certain idea how you want your child to develop, and that has to be the standard, and then you'd have to give us some idea what that is. But you see, I'm, I'm here myself being guilty of being a little abstract because I don't want to, uh, we, we, there's no point going into the whole thing, but do, uh, do I indicate enough to, to uh, indicate to you the level on which you have to pitch it? And the main thing is you have to always take broad abstractions and do the following. Contrast them with what they are opposite to. Distinguish them from other crucial ones you use and give the most concrete examples you can of their application. Now, you did not do those three things, you see. You, there was a certain amount of concretizing. In connection with one of these, I noticed you mentioned um, tell him, don't, don't say, do it because I say so. Now, that was fine. That would, that would be a recognizable 
example. Uh, but you needed more uh, of that. Many fewer abstractions, much more uh, detailed. For, the, for that reason, I thought that the pace was off, you see. I thought too much material poured. Uh, in a way, the audience couldn't uh, digest, but that's really a, a derivative problem. Uh, the reason for that problem was because of the lack of concretization. If you'd known that was necessary, you couldn't have given them uh, uh, all that material. So in a way, it, the problem was with the Crow epistemology, but that wasn't your primary problem. That was simply a result of not knowing how many uh, broad abstractions uh, uh, they could take. Now, who else had something? Uh, I have a few other lesser points, but who had something on this? I'm sorry, I cut you off before. Yes. Go ahead. There were these which? Milestones. Milestones, right. Well, you are in effect suggesting that she's taking a Piaget type of approach that there are definite developmental milestones and the parents, you're saying, uh, should uh, uh, take cognizance of them as they develop. But I don't believe that that was your intention to, to take that kind of view. No, she was talking, I think, more broadly uh, than what particular milestones at any particular stage or even whether there are, she was trying to say, you, in effect, you have to bring the child up in contact with reality, with uh, uh, reason, uh, um, uh, with his own value. That really was her uh, uh, main point. So it's a question of, uh, did she get those points uh, across? Yes? Uh, you said there was a certain um, uh, indefiniteness about the talk, whether it was how to bring up a child or how to think about bringing up a child. I, I believe when you say, Ms. Vandenberg, you were focused on the first, how to bring up a child, but one of her central points was you have to know how to think about bringing up a child in order to bring it up. So she was trying to give, so to speak, epistemological guidance uh, on top of uh, child rearing advice, but if your suggestion is that's too much in 10 minutes, I, I would agree with that because that is two distinct topics. One is what to do when, even in very broad philosophic terms, and the other is how to get clear, clear in your own mind about this whole subject. One is the content, the other is more the, the parents' thinking method, and there was a certain tendency for you uh, to combine the two. Um, what I wanted to say, just one other point. Now, you'll have to forgive me if I'm a little disorganized because I just put these down as they occur to me. Uh, but I did want to say something on that point about emphasis. Um, I definitely, leaving now aside the question of the exact definitions and so on, the way you deal with the content, I do not believe you were completely satisfactory with regard to emphasis. This is what be the difference. This is what I would ideally have liked in regard to this point of emphasis. The first uh, important point I want to cover is objectivity. Objectivity. That's very important. By objectivity, I mean you have to pay attention to the facts of reality. And then go on. You see, now you, you pause, you stress it, but you did, uh, you speeded right on through it so even if you did give, let us say, a perfectly appropriate definition, and even if, as that gentleman originally suggested, it was loud and louder than the rest, it went by, and remember, people, the better people try to take notes. Uh, not always the better, but many people try to take <laughs> notes. And there's nothing more frustrating, as students have told me bitterly, uh, than uh, to get down the first four words of somebody's definition, and they're already into the next thing and you throw the pen down and you say, oh, hell. 
you know, that's, uh, and you lose the whole thing. So, uh, uh, but to give a moment, any definition you should pause. It's a very crucial thing, and particularly for heavy, abstract definitions of that kind, you see. Go slower, stress it, wait, repeat, and uh, I always repeat a key word, like I say, objectivity. Objectivity. Oh, be, you know, whatever you have to do <laughs> to hit them over the head with that, and then you can zip through it again if your material is uh, light enough to take it. But I definitely felt your pace was too um, uh, fast, uh, that it was not uh, emphasized enough. Somebody else, we have just a few, we, we don't want to subject to Ms. Vandenberg to <laughs> hour after hour. There's just a few of the <laughs> essential points here, but if you think you have some, uh, yes. I see. She, uh, I didn't notice that myself. I was maybe taking notes on some other point, but this lady suggests that you gave a good motivation, the, app, the parallel to architecture, and then you said you expect the child to become a rational adult on his own, and she says most people don't think in those terms, so they wouldn't necessarily recognize that as a motivational element. I'd have to hear the context. I don't remember the exact wording. That didn't strike me. But what did strike me was one point you would have been better for the same price to conclude somewhat differently because you'd already milked that parallel to architecture and therefore it kind of fell flat when you said it again at the end. Now you see it would be better to give, uh, you want to have a dramatic ending because the ending sticks in people's mind. We, I think we said the beginning and the end are the most crucial because the opening determines whether they'll listen and the closing determines whether they'll remember. So if you could get something different, now for instance, it depends how briefly you could do it, but if you could, effective ending might be, uh, which you couldn't do in the beginning because it would be arbitrary, but after, if you had concretized these points sufficiently, then at the end you say, if you want to know what the difference is, and then you contrast a, you know, a tortured or neurotic uh, child, in a brief terms that they would recognize in such a way, it would have to be skillfully done, that you could do it briefly, but they could see this is going to be the product of, you know, irrational, dogmatic, arbitrary, and non-objective parents, as opposed to, and then a few glowing words of what they could have instead, you see. Then it's, it's also a motivational conclusion. It wouldn't be as arbitrary as it would be at the beginning, where there was no explanation of it, and it's a better, more effective ending, something different, you see, than just saying over again, because you've already used that up, so you don't get any more mileage out of it. The audience just tunes out. As soon as they, oh yeah, we know that, and that's it, you see, so you just lose them at the end. The only last content point that I wanted to, give me one second here to see if I'm leaving anything else out. Uh, the last content point I want to mention is it's always very important when you go into uh, individual, individualism, treat him as an individual, stress his uh, self-development, remember he's an individual. All, you said, I believe I took down this phrase, compare him to himself, not to others, and so on. Now, there is always, particularly in the 20th century, one blatant way in which that type of thing will be misheard. And you have to take cognizance of that and either in your wording or explicitly set yourself apart from that. What is the way that that will be heard? Uh, any of those terms, individual or any of the equivalents in today's world, now this wouldn't be true in a better world, but it certainly is true of even completely innocent and honest people today. In the end. The pardon? Well, you said they would interpret it as being selfish. If so, that's okay. <laughs> I wouldn't object to them interpreting it as being selfish, but that's uh, not the commonest interpretation. There's a much more common. Do we have somebody with red hair on the aisle?
or put, you say it could be interpreted as condoning the attitude of do your own thing, or put that as a philosophic term, right. and with an S. <laughs> Subjectivity, right. Now, a lot of people take individualism as mean, do whatever you feel like, particularly, therefore, in the context of a talk where you've just stressed objectivity. When you say treat him as an individual, you have to say something to indicate, and I don't mean that I'm contradicting everything I said before, you see. So you have to say something like, this is completely compatible with treating him objectively and going by facts, but the fact is, in certain respects, he is unique, and that's a fact that you have to respect, you see. As long as you just put in something like that so the audience thinks, oh, it's, this is not the standard, you know, do your own uh, uh, thing. As a general, this is the issue of the audience context. You have to take into account how you can be misheard within limits. Now, I don't want to commit the error of the crow by giving so many points that you can retain it. The main problem, as I see it, uh, to summarize, is the pace of treating abstractions. The, the uh, first thing that the first uh, criticism made is what I would say is the essential not concretized enough, too uh, floating, and consequently uh, a big problem. The main virtue is that it's forthright, motiv motivated, organized, and we can therefore know exactly what you aim to do and know how to criticize it. So it's definitely, I think, has some good points, and I'd like to congratulate you, and I hope that you're not uh, offended or in any way upset by our suggestions from the front. So let's again thank uh, Ms. Vandenberg. Now we're going to turn to the second uh, volunteer this evening, Mr. Stubblefield, whose uh, topic is the objectivist ethics, which he is going to present to an audience of conservatives, that is, people who are already advocates of or sympathetic to capitalism, but they know nothing about objectivism or the need for uh, philosophy. Mr. Stubble. Just take a minute to get yourself organized. Oh. Thank you, Dr. Pico. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me, Barry? Do you have trouble defending capitalism? Do you wonder why the noose of government control is tightening around our necks while the polls indicate that people, that public opinion is swinging to the right? Do you wonder what these questions have to do with my topic, which is the objectivist ethics? The answer is contained in a single sentence. In order to defend capitalism, you must do so from a proper moral base. That moral base is the objectivist ethics. I'm not going to speak to you tonight about capitalism, about economics. I'm going to talk to you about the objectivist ethics. Given the short amount of time, I'm only going to make three points. But I will illustrate each of those points with some example to point out the trouble that you might have defending capitalism from some other base. Okay, the first point I want to make is that ethics is necessary. That is, you need ethics. What is ethics? Ethics or morality is a code of values to guide the choices and actions of man's life. Ethics, let me repeat that, morality is a code of values which will guide the choices and actions of your life. You can think of ethics like as being a road map, except instead of telling you where you're going to go, it will tell you what you're going to be. So 
So at each point of your life, it helps you make your choices. It helps you decide. It helps you move, act. It tells you, for example, if you want to be a success, if you want to be happy, then you should produce. You should work for yourself. If you don't mind winding up being a shiftless no good, then you don't have to produce. You can steal, etc. Now, no human action is independent of ethics. Everything you do depends on ethics. Now, in particular, economics is not independent of ethics. Uh, the relationship between, between ethics or morality and economics is very much the same in one regard as the relationship between biology and nutrition. By that I mean morality sets the standard for economics and for nutrition it is biology which sets the standard. For example, if you were to study nutrition or to make nutritious recommendations without respect to the standards of biology, without respect to life and death, you wouldn't know whether to prescribe protein or poison. And economics, without reference to morality, the effect that you get is you will have some conservative economist advocating free trade and claiming that that means free trade with communist Russia, taking, selling military planes to red China. Now, ethics is necessary for you. It's necessary for all human action. So that's the first point I wanted to make. The second point is that the objectivist ethics holds that the highest value is your life. Remember I said ethics is a code to guide you and your actions. Well, the highest value of that code is your life. For example, in the economic realm, when you produce, you own the product. And this is the answer that you need to answer the, this is the, Yes, I said it right. This is the answer you need to answer the welfare statists who are claiming that you should be sacrificing your product, that you should work and earn, and that somebody else should dispense your earnings to other people. In order to say that is wrong, you need morality. And in order to say that that is wrong, the standard by which it is wrong, the value, has to be your own life. So the second point that I've made is that you have to be selfish. But you ask, how can you defend such a term as selfishness? The answer is that you need a standard. And this is the third point that I want to make. The trouble that you get into in economics is exemplified by, uh, by those people who claim that a mugger in Central Park is acting in his self-interest. Now, usually the term is not put quite so boldly as that. Uh, you may get it put to you as, wouldn't you steal a million dollars if you thought you could get away with it? Uh, this makes me think of Oscar Wilde's put down of a very snooty aristocratic lady. And uh, he said, uh, Madam, would you spend the, the night with me for 10,000 pounds? And she said, yes, I believe I would. And uh, he said, well, would you do so for a shilling? And she said, oh, heavens no, what do you take me for? He said, we've already determined that. <laughs> now we're just dickering over the price. In order to make that determination, you need a standard. In order to call the mugger a thief, you need a standard. Objectivist ethics holds that the standard is man's life. The difference between the mugger and a man is that he is not surviving at the human level. 
he is surviving at the level of the brute. He is surviving by purely using brute force. The difference between men and brutes is that men possess the faculty of reason. I can't say more about that. I, I, I'm sure I'm running out of time. I forgot to set my watch at the beginning. Um, but the point is that the economic point with respect to this is that production is good. That is, this is a combination of economic and, and, and a moral point. Production is good and theft is bad. The way that you know that is the standard of man's life. Production is the use of reason. Theft is not. Now, if I was really so fast as I have the two minutes left that Dr. Peikoff indicated, I'm now running short. <laughs> um, nonetheless, I'm going to sum up. If a long enough pause for laughter, then I'll, I'll come out just right. <laughs> Okay, I've illustrated my topic by examples from the field of economics. But the real point is that ethics applies to all of your life, not only to economic matters. So you need ethics to live your life. So let me sum up the three points that I've made. I just repeated the first one. You need ethics. The second point, the purpose of your life is you. The thing at the end of the roadmap will be your life and the third point is that in order to guide yourself along that roadmap, you have to use reason. What you need for yourself, not only what capitalism needs, but what you need is rational selfishness. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Stubberfield. Again, we will take, before any comments, one or two minutes to organize our thoughts. All right, now let us uh, look at Mr. Stubblefield's uh, talk. This time I try to avoid making any comment in advance and ask your opinion of a choice of three estimates. How many say essentially good? Now we have about half, I would say. How many say Mixed, oh no, that wins out. And how many say negative? Well, we have a large number saying negative. Let me just say in advance, I definitely do not agree with negative uh, as an estimate. As to the rest, let's wait till we see what emerges uh, from the discussion. And I will want to start again with the um, positive uh, elements first, and there were a number of very good virtues to this talk. Um, uh, whoever thought it was uh, mixed or positive, let me hear some of the good things about this talk, because it's very easy and very instructive, and uh, yes? Um, the, the pace was, the pace mainly, it was, it was slow and you The pace, you say, was correct. Yes, I wrote down the pace is excellent. This is an oral presentation. This was not a written presentation that you uh, uh, felt was going on no matter what, that you had to struggle with. It was very good. He slowed up when he gave a definition. He paused. He repeated. You definitely had the feeling he was monitoring the audience. Um, it was very good example of extemporaneous uh, delivery because you could see in many cases that he was thinking on his feet. I think a very effective touch at that point, which really helps to win an audience, was that, which I don't believe you were diabolical enough to plan, <laughs> although speakers do, you know, but was that one where you got halfway through a sentence and said, is that right? Yes, that's what I mean. That was just extemporaneous, right? Yes. And, um, <laughs> Uh, you could see, therefore, the mind actually operating and thinking uh, as he went, circling around, uh, correcting. Uh, this was uh, 
therefore very good uh, from that point of view. Uh, as far as I could see, he was looking at the audience. Uh, he was aware of their uh, uh, requirements. So absolutely, with regard to pace and the monitoring of the audience, I think it was excellent. Are you uh, an experienced speaker? The only one sign I could see that you weren't experienced, you say you're not, uh, was that you were nervous as indicated by the timbre of your voice. Uh, and that is something that a beginning speaker can uh, not do anything about. That's automatic. But you did exactly the right thing. Uh, that is to say, you just go on no matter what. <laughs> And uh, if an audience is at all disconcerted by that, they take your estimate of it. And if they see that your nervousness doesn't stop you, they just say to hell with it and set it aside, and they stop paying any attention to it. Um, that happens to everybody at the, that was about the only sign I could see of your actual delivery that uh, indicated you hadn't had much experience because your voice was cracking. But there's nothing you can do about that, and that is not uh, distracting. And that would go away across time as you saw audience after audience and talk after talk. And it's really nothing different than in your own living room, and you automatize the skill. And all the what ifs have vanished. What if I forget, and what if the audience revolts, and so on. <laughs> then you relax, and you just do it normally. But um, you were very effective. So uh, uh, if you learned that from this course, I'm very pleased. Uh, because on many of the points, uh, I also thought, well, let's take some more virtues from the method of delivery. Yes, sir. Of course, motivation was excellent. Um, uh, his, his opening voice was very strong. It really captured my attention. Moreover, now, wait, let me, uh, first I have to repeat so people can hear. And you made two different points. You said his motivation is excellent, his opening voice uh, strong. was strong and captured you. The second I agree with, but now the first you say about his motivation. What was the motivation? that he offered at the outset, as you understand it. OK, well, uh, well the point I want to make is that although he was dealing with a subject that uh, conservatives would not normally care to deal with, namely ethics, um, he brought the audience directly to that subject by tying it to something they do uh, want to deal with. Which is defending capital. capital. Well, the gentleman says that the motivation was excellent because uh, an audience of conservatives would normally have nothing to do with ethics. And yet, uh, they do try to defend capitalism, and he brought it right to their home grounds and said, in effect, you need this talk for purposes of defending capitalism. Now, it is certainly true that you did that. So I would myself give you A for your intention with regard to motivation, but I wouldn't have be able to give A for the actual implementing of it. If anybody had any criticism of the motivation, although we're interrupting the positive, let's hold that for a moment. Let me just say that I think there are some questions about the implementation of your motivation, although you did try. So let's accept that as a partial compliment to come back to it. Who else has something positive? Let us delimit ourselves for the moment to the method of presentation, the, oral, the technique of oral delivery, because uh, I gave him very high marks on all the elements involved in oral delivery. Yes. Humor. Yes, the use of humor was very good. And, and uh, um, I have with one question I have. But um, the best way that you started was when you said, can you hear me? You deliberately repeated the line knowing it would get a laugh, you see. So you, you uh, eased your audience right at the very beginning because they don't know what to expect. You know, 10 minutes of listening to a ghastly speaker is a nightmare. And therefore, uh, if you can just tell them it's not going to be so bad and signal right off the bat, uh, they relax and it, it is very good. And you did use humor. You have a nice, dry humor, which is, uh, you know, comes to you when you need it, and you liven things up. I made several points of where that is. Now, you did, however, have one prepared joke, right? And that was <laughs> Oscar Wilde. Now, um, you got a polite laugh from that, but you did not get the laugh that you did from your extemporaneous ones. And that, by the way, is why I don't uh, do that. You did, in effect, what I do uh, when you give a prepared joke, which is that reminds me of. And then you start, obviously, telling a story that you had thought at home would get a laugh. And if you do it that way, an audience gets nervous because they know they have to laugh and they're waiting for it. <laughs> you know. And then the thought goes through their mind, is this really relevant? And I, I must say it was a, bit, a little bit stretched here because <laughs> you were uh, 
going to talk about a mugger thought it was to his self-interest to steal a million dollars. I could not get the connection to Oscar Wilde's uh, definition of the woman losing her integrity. It wasn't common that they were doing something bad for a sum of money, but that's a very broad... <laughs> uh, it was strained, but the notion was a standard. Yes, well, uh, you say it was strained, but the notion was a standard. It was, however, so broad that it, it was slightly disconcerting. But uh, uh, the problem with a prepared joke is, first, it has to be relevant, you know, directly perceptible, not obvious to the audience that you have got this you know, prepared. And the second thing is you have to say it with complete consummate confidence, which I cannot do. But a real stand-up comic can tell a joke that he thinks is awful. There's a certain type, you can see them on Johnny Carson or whichever, they come in and they just look at you and say, good evening, and you're ready to laugh. <laughs> They project that this is just the funniest situation ever. Uh, that is a skill which I couldn't teach nor even practice. But if you can do it, okay. If not, you happen to have a good, dry sense of extemporaneous humor. I would tend more to rely on that. But generally speaking, you did make an effective uh, use of humor, and you had an audience uh, that was definitely sympathetic and, and attentive to you. What else uh, was good in the manner of delivery? Yeah. You have something negative to say about the joke? Well, if it's brief, yes. You found the joke offensive? Why would the joke be offensive? Well, I was hoping you would I'm sorry. I thought it was a charming joke. I'd heard it before, but uh, in any event, that would take us on a side discussion. <laughs> Who has a, a comment on the method the, from the positive point of view? Yes. Yes, no, I do see there's an abstract connection. I don't want to hammer the joke to death. Let us, <laughs> let us drop that. Who has a different aspect of something positive about this on the aisle? Yes. Yes, repetition uh, was good. Uh, and in different words, uh, I copied down at one point. I, I can't take shorthand, so I couldn't give all the wording. But you said, ethics is necessary. You need ethics. And that kind of repetition is exactly what I call the circling around. You see, you said it two different ways, uh, not the exact same words. You brought out two aspects. It's necessary to man, and that means you, and you got to say it twice for the same price, so you emphasized it. So in general, your repetition was good, uh, your emphasis was good, you were loud, your timing came out fine, your transitions were perfectly clear, we knew what you were going to do, your structure was uh, very... Uh, uh, straightforward. You, I didn't never had the feeling of pressure, except when I got off on what what I say is wrong with that content, and then I had the split focus. Part, I had to keep track of what you were saying, and part trying to name what was wrong, but that isn't your fault. Uh, I mean, uh, as a method of presentation, you did not overload uh, the audience, and um, uh, in that respect, uh, I think you, you handled the technical requirements very well. What else was good? I mean, there are many more good things than bad in this, so therefore I couldn't begin to see how you could regard this, how anyone could regard this as essentially a bad presentation, because this was certainly not that. Uh, at the very back, yes. Yeah. Yes, he had good concretization. You say the uh, biology, nutrition, economics, ethics parallel. That is one example, although I have a question about that when we get there. But the intention to concretize, to give examples, went uh, throughout uh, his presentation. He said, for example, many times, uh, why you need ethics, um, uh, uh, what else? Uh, for, uh, there were several places. What, what? The road map. The uh, he had, in many different cases, I, you did not have the feeling that this was floating abstractions. You could see at each case what he meant uh, concretely. So I would say fine uh, on that count. In general, to summarize the positives, the pace was excellent. 
concretization was fine. And what, by pace, I therefore subsume all the things that go to make a good pace, the pauses, the repetition, the so on. The structure was clear. Humor was a valuable uh, element. And you did give it extemporaneously, so you, could, you kept your audience. And you did hold your audience. That's true. Now let's come to uh, any problems with this presentation. Now I'd like to hear from you what you think are the problems, remembering now that the, the gentleman had 10 minutes to uh, cover this subject, so that has to be a mitigating factor, because uh, when he agreed to do it, I told him this would be fantastic to try to do this in 10 minutes, but that I wouldn't hold him to making a really convincing case in 10 minutes to an audience of conservatives, because I've tried that across many hours and failed. And <laughs> therefore, um, uh, uh, we have to bear that in mind. But taking it as a small scale, within that, the framework that this was impossible and it's just an exercise, what kind of problems uh, do you see? I'm trying to take somebody different, if I can remember. Yes. Well, the, the objection raised is uh, that it was clear to the gentleman why he would need ethics in general, but not why he would need the objectivist ethics as opposed to any other ethics. Now, I think that is ultimately a valid criticism, but let's try to specify why. Because he did say something about the objectivist ethics. After all, he said uh, that the highest value is your life, and he tied that into, this means in economics, you own your, the, your, the products that you yourself create, as opposed to the need to sacrifice them, and uh, why the objectivist ethics uh, stresses production, which is essential to capitalism. So he did say a few things. It's not as though he baldly did what you say. That is, he didn't give a whole talk on, you need ethics and then say, that means the objective is ethics, goodbye. He said something. So tell, tell me, anybody now who agrees with this criticism, what is it that he did not do to make the transition from, to, to, to emphasize the point of the objective is ethics as opposed to ethics as such? You see that it's two different topics. One is, why should an audience with an economic viewpoint care about ethics at all? And then more specifically, why should they care about this particular ethics? Now, by your subject, you had to do both. Now, you did, in a general way, cover why you couldn't get around ethics. But he says you didn't do so well with the question of the objectivist ethics. Now, would anybody want to elaborate, in the light of his actual references to it, why this criticism never holds? Yes, on the aisle. Well, you say the first point, you, you were misled into thinking it was going to be three points about ethics when it was really one point on why you need ethics and two on ethics. Well, that per se, on, the, on objectivist ethics, that per se is not a fatal criticism if the two points then carried. And he said, well, the two points he offered were your life and reason in his summary. And those, after all, are certainly central to objectivism. And therefore, I agree with this criticism, but I don't think the wording the explanation has yet been given as to why this um, criticism is, is applicable. I can see a blonde in the rear. I can't hear you, though. Yes, the audience knows nothing about objectivism or philosophy. They know only the audience for this talk are advocates of capitalism as typical conservatives. That's it. Well, are you, are you making an, a lied or a distinct point? You say there's a criticism of using terminology that would not be familiar to a, 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 an outside audience without defining and concretizing it. Is that relevant to this point that we're on right now, or is that a distinct point as to why he didn't convince them that objectivism specifically is necessary? I 
I see. In other words, you say if, if you don't define the ethics clearly to them, it can't be too meaningful why they need it. Now, you are correct that there were some very generalized formulations that he gave about the objectivist ethics. Uh, he tried to specify what he meant, so what was the problem? He tried, he had about, uh, you actually ran out a minute early, so you had nine minutes. So let's say you took about, oh, I would say four of those minutes on introdu introduction and the role of ethics. So you had approximately five minutes to this audience on why objectivism in particular. And in that five minute period, you tried to cover that your life is the standard, um, uh, that this involves selfishness, uh, that selfishness involves uh, production as opposed to uh, surviving on a subhuman level, and that this means the use of reason. That is really as the content that you communicated. Now the question is, can you do that in a way that's convincing in that amount of time? And actually, you cannot. You cannot, and you, by, you had your choice, you see, in, a po in, a, in this type of assignment. Am I going to try to give them a kind of a contour of objectivism, a mini view, four big points, life, reason, selfishness, production, and give one quick shot tie-in of each to capitalism? It has to be life, otherwise you can't keep your property. It has to be reason, otherwise the mugger uh, can run wild, etc. One, two, three, like that, which is all your time permits. Or what is your alternative strategy with the same su subject but such a limited time? Now, you try, tried number one, and she says, and I, this woman is an uh, objector, and I think validly that, for a reason we'll in illustrate shortly, it, it had the effect that the formulations are so generalized that it didn't really convince them, it didn't really hit home. Uh, what would be an alternative strategy for the same um, purpose? Yes. Yes. I, in a case like this, you have to pick your spot, you see. You have to decide breadth or depth, a whole survey or one dagger to the heart, so to speak. Now, in 10 minutes, you take the dagger approach. In other words, and you don't have to pretend that that's all. I mean, uh, an ethics consists of a great many different theories, so you don't have to pretend that it's all, but it would be a much more effective strategy in terms of conviction. Again, because of the time that's required to grasp these things. If you said you need ethics in general, but you don't, you need specifically the kind of ethics that makes capitalism possible. Now, what does capitalism consist of? You say, I'm just blurting this out, you understand, if you awarded it at home, it would be better. But the idea is people left free to pursue their own profit to make money by trade on a free market. Under capitalism, does the government have the right to control you? No. Does it have the right to control you even if that would help the needy? No, et cetera. You give it just on the terms of what capitalism is that they can recognize. The government under capitalism can't do this even if, and then you give various examples of where altruism would say it should. And you say, but in fact, today in the world, the government is doing all those things, and what is it appealing to, to justify them? And then you say, it says, so-and-so needs it, so-and-so needs it, we have to sacrifice, and so on. Now it should be obvious to you, then, you say. If you don't know anything else about ethics, ethics is 50 issues, let us say, but there's only one thing you have to know. If sacrifice is the imperative, capitalism is out. You may as well make up your mind to it, and if you want to advocate capitalism, give up sacrifice. But then how do you live? Then you have to have some other approach. You say, be selfish, but what does selfish mean? And you tell them, that's a big question. There's so many different theories. You need an ethics to tell you. That's what objectivism would tell you. Read such and such, thank you. You see? <laughs> <coughs> you see what the, the two different types of approach would be. Now, let, uh, you understand that in, in, the, in both types of talk, you can only give them a hint. But it's a question of the pace, and the, the hardest thing to grasp. And here I'm speaking now not of pace in your oral delivery, because the oral pace was fine. But the 
content of abstractions that people can take in who do not know them. Uh, the hardest thing for people without experience to grasp is how slow, how slowly you have to go in terms of the amount of content. In 10 minutes, the most you can do is say, don't sacrifice. And you know, you say it and you say, I mean by that so and so, as it gains such and such, and here's an example, and this is why it's important, your 10 minutes is gone, you see. Y you have to get out of the idea that, well, Reason, point one, one minute. Uh, uh, no sacrifice, point one, one minute. Production, point, you know, you can't hit those things that way. If you could, the world would be in a completely different state. It would mean that those terms are familiar, the context is familiar, what you want to say is familiar, and you're more or less reminding them. You always have to decide about a point. Is this new to your audience, or are you reminding them? If you're merely reminding, you can throw it away. As we all know, man has rights. That you could say to a conservative group, you see. But as, as we all know, uh, man should be selfish, or even without the as we all know, you can't say, you see. Now, let us look at some of your formulations just from the aspect, not, you see, they weren't floating abstractions in the sense that within the limits of 10 minutes you did what was possible, but the questions they raised. When you got to the objective as ethics, you, your first point was um, the highest value is your life. Now, we, here's an audience listening to this for the first time, and they say the highest value, I believe you even said the standard is your life, right? If I did, I switched well, okay, let's drop that because we can't hold you to the exact wording in an extemporaneous pro, uh, delivery. But you say the highest value is your life. What question immediately I, I wrote in the margin, what uh, an uninitiated audience would immediately ask. You're proposing an ethics where you say the highest value is your life. So what question would that lead an audience that doesn't know the rest of your viewpoint? Anybody? What else is high? Question? What else is higher? He says nothing is higher. So you mean you think they would be convinced by that? Oh, you think they think that would be self-evident? Well, that's a different approach, uh, expectation than I would have because if you present that to an audience, you get a different type of question if they're not an objectivist audience. If you simply came in and said, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to present you a, to my ethics, I believe the highest value is your own life. Thank you very much and sit down. <laughs> what is the question that they would say? Yes. Can a criminal then say, it's my life? Does your life mean anybody's life at any price? Now, true, ultimately, as you went along, you did indicate you didn't approve of muggers and sacrifice <laughs> and so on. But if the standard is your life, the question is, why not? Now, all you said was you wouldn't be surviving on a human level, which you said on a later point. But what is a human level? That's not rhetorical. What is a human level? <laughs> reason, you say. You did mention reason, but unless I missed it, you mentioned it only at the very end. Is that right? Because I didn't notice the word reason until you got to your summary. Was it before I'm then? To say what human meant. Uh, you said you say what human meant. Human was the rational. Did you say anything about why man has to use reason if life is the standard? Well, you see, that's you say only by implication, but that is such an essential point because otherwise it comes down, if they don't see the connection, that reason is his actual tool of survival. You can only live by using the mind, etc. And even that, you see, you couldn't say in that form because right away people would say, what about irrational people? They live. So you have to present it in, in, a, in an objective way. But if all you said is in effect, if the message they get is your life is the standard and you have to do this in a human way, and a human is rational. But what is rational then? Well, he doesn't like muggers, but if it's his life is the standard, suppose he gets away with it. Now, did, um, did you not say something to, uh, which, yes, you, didn't you say when you were, I'm going back now, 
earlier to your talk in the beginning, you said um, either you produce and work for yourself or you could steal if you don't mind. If it, didn't you say words to that effect? Now, if we, that perhaps was simply you were trying to appeal to, well, obviously they would disapprove of stealing. But we hear this now as a total presentation. And you tell us uh, at one point, well, depends, you know, do you mind or not? And then later the standard is your life. And the reason you can't do certain things is that wouldn't be human. But they don't see why they wouldn't be human since human beings do it. And you haven't told them what human faculty has to be employed or why if life is the standard. And what comes across is the net effect. Plus, when we throw in, you have to be selfish with only the very briefest uh, indication that you need a standard, and the standard is man's life. Um, what is the net effect that comes across? That it's some kind of subjectivism, you see, some kind of, it's the same type of problem in a way as from the first paper. The problem of presenting ideas in today's world is always not to fall into one or the other of two uh, false views. To assume objectivity at the price of, there's nothing in it for you of being disinterested, or to fall into subjectivism while stressing selfishness, you see. And it, it, you were, it's not that your formulations were so bad. The audience's context, as it would have to be today, combined with the density of points you were trying to make forced you into that, you see. So even though you went out of your way to try to exemplify and so on, and define, uh, the, the assignment defeated you. Uh, um, and it ended up with the, uh, the net impression, well, I need some kind of values, but I don't see why I need this particular code. I don't see why I need any code as such. It's whatever you don't mind or whatever, you know, fits your sense of the human. Now, as I said, that was an implication of uh, the net effect. Uh, did I answer the point at the back there? Is that the type of point you had in mind? Yes, in fact, uh, my further point was too much. So you're satisfied with that? Yes. Okay. Now, uh, I wanted to make one other. Oh, yes. Even within the framework of the way you did it, you would have to give a little more emphasis. Remember that your point here is why advocates of capitalism need objectivism, right? Therefore, you would constantly have to make your emphasis follow your theme. Now, you did it, but you tended to throw it away. For instance, take as a, as a small example. You said uh, the highest value is your life, and that means your product. Now, you didn't give any further elaboration. You, in effect, as, I, as far as I could follow your reasoning, it was, well, I gave them the application to capitalism, and I got to get on to new material. But remember, in that audience, in that theme, this is the point that, ma that matters. It's more important that they understand why they need a certain type of ethics than that they grasp what it is. Now, you have to tell them something about it, otherwise they don't know what you're talking about. But the stress would have to go always, if you're going to do their scattershot, repeated one point after the other, you see why you need this to defend capitalism. You'd at least have to pause and say, how are you going to defend private property? Private property is essential to capitalism. How are you going to defend it if you don't have a private life, you see, or something of that sort? But uh, and this, uh, the same with the way you treated sacrifice. You, uh, you mentioned it. But you mentioned it, you said, in effect, yeah, yes, you need the kind of ethics which recognizes, I don't know, man's rights or whichever, is against the kind that tells them to sacrifice for others, and then you went right on. Now, that's a big point. That's a bombshell. And that's the, really the essence of the whole thing as far as politics is concerned. And therefore, when you get to that, you have to stop. You have to you know, look at them, and you have to say, now the choice is capitalism or the ethics of sacrifice, after you've elaborated. It's either or. And if you see that, this is why you need objectivism, because other, every other ethics tells you this, you see. So you covered it, but your emphasis was completely off, not in the narrow sense that you, you 
He didn't race over it or swallow it uh, linguistically, but in terms of the centrality of it in the presentation, you didn't take that point and stun the audience with its impact, you see. And yet that is really what you would have to do um, in this uh, type of talk. So uh, the problem really comes down to how much can an audience take in who doesn't know it in advance? And my general advice, if in doubt, reduce. Fewer abstractions, more emphasis, more contrast of your view to some other view, more examples. Um, let me just have one second to see if I have any uh, oh, I have a minor question. Right at the beginning, you said, if you had trouble defending capitalism, um, and then you made a reference to the swing to the right. Well, what the swing to the right seemed to me in that context to be demotivating because they figured, well, we don't have the right ethics and we're still going to the right, so what do we need it for? Uh, what, what was the advantage of mentioning the swing to the right? Oh, I see. I misunderstood you. Uh, well, maybe that's just I didn't hear it. You said you, matter, you, you wondered why. You said why the government controls keep getting uh, bigger even though there's a swing to the right. Yes. I would have slowed that first part down a bit because I, what I wrote about motivation, I remember there was a, a content of motivation. I wrote too fast, uh, a little too quick. Even if your content was okay, you have to set that motivation firmly. So you'd have to just elaborate a couple more sentences, say, you know capitalism is the best system. I don't have to convince you of that. But it's failing. Why? Why do you have trouble? Even though the public is with you, logic is with you, economics is with you, but you're losing. Why? That's all. See, just that much. And then they will listen. See, it's not much more than you said, but it's just that little extra bit to pass from kind of dutiful motivation, you, know, you have trouble, I'm going to give you the solution, to emphasizing it so they get gripped, elaborating it a tiny bit. You see, it's much better uh, not to slight uh, motivation, which is a bit fast uh, in your case. Now, just let me take a look and see what other small things I might have here. We don't want to subject your individual formulations to analysis because you can't do that in oral presentation. I just noticed that uh, you threw away sacrifice, and I put in the margin, but does the audience agree that it's wrong? Uh, you, uh, they might very well hear sacrifice as good. Um, I believe, in essence, that covers. Does anybody have any essential points that they want to make that could be made briefly? Yes, sir. I think uh, in the context of talking about the objective ethics, certainly a good introduction would be to say, this is the philosophy of Ayn Rand, which expressed itself in that elaborate thrust, yeah. which is a, an overtly figurative and absurd sort of question. Oh, you mean that somewhere in the, in the uh, presentation, you indicate whose philosophy this is, the philosophy of Ayn Rand, and where they can read about it. No, but everyone is familiar in some way with some of that was thrust Oh, you mean so? Just simply, yeah. Well, a lot of people are familiar, yes. It's also valuable to give the credit, so it would be helpful. But in, I guess he assumed in this audience. Uh, I was hoping you would do that. Right. <laughs> uh, yes. No, I've spoken, taken you. Who's at the back there? Yes. Well, I, I don't, I'm not sure that's a fair criticism. You say he said he wasn't going to deal with economics and he used it as examples, but that's a bit equivocal because he meant he's not going to give them the economic case for capitalism. In that sense, his subject is ethics, not economics. But his subject was the need of 
ethics by an economist or people with an economic viewpoint, and therefore to make re reference to economics repeatedly is perfectly okay. So I don't uh, see that criticism. I'll take one or two others if you feel they're really essential, but we don't want to go past the point of no returns. Yes. Well, you were bothered by the passage from going from not, he said people went from not working to being shiftless and no good, and you thought that was too big a jump. We'd have to recreate his exact wording, but on that level, we need the co content before us. So I didn't notice that. No, I, need it. I only want overall comments at this point. There's no use picking on individual wording because you could do that on anything that comes out of an extemporaneous uh, mouth. You, there are really that many urgent comments, so we'll take uh, a <laughs> letter. Yes. I just wanted to say, I like the fact that he was honest with the audience. I think he had, he had In what a, form was he honest with the audience? I'm talking about in his presentation. If he made mistakes, he said so. Oh, yes. That, that I, I think I tried that to indicate. Humor. I'm saying that that kind of honesty. Yes, he was perfectly straightforward with the audience. That's what I tried to indicate by saying, you could call it honesty if you want, but he let you in on his mental processes, and that's what gives it the aura of the uh, extemporaneous uh, presentation. I'm sorry, if uh, he will entertain comments, you can go to, up to him afterwards <laughs> and make your suggestion to him, but I think we've uh, now commented at sufficient length to extract what we could from it. So again, I would, I would think it's definitely, if I gave my own assessment, on the high mixed, <laughs> if I could uh, use that uh, uh, division. Uh, the only reason, it's very, it's, I would say definitely good in mechanics of presentation, but the problem was too much content, which had to be too vague and therefore uh, in its net uh, not convincing, which would bring it down to that extent. But it was very helpful, and I think it helped illuminate issues for us. So I would like to thank you again, uh, Mr. Stone. Let me start on this big uh, collection of written questions. <clears throat> Can the rules you are teaching about objective communication also apply in personal one-to-one -one talks between just two people, or would that kind of verbal exchange in which mutual understanding is a primary goal have to be taught in a different kind of class than this one? As the same type of answer that I have given to people who asked about acting or journalism or whichever, all communication involves certain broad similarities. You're still using concepts to communicate some kind of content. But the, this course is specifically concerned with ideological communication, how to present abstract ideas and pr primarily philosophic ideas to audiences that don't already know them. Now, that is not the same thing as what you mean here, personal one-to-one -one communication, like uh, your emotions or your, whether you're in love with someone or you have a grievance with them or whatever. It's still the case that that kind of communication, you have to use words a certain way and you have to be objective and so on, but it's not, uh, the, the, the detailed application is not the same. So I would never say that from this course you will uh, learn uh, how to uh, declare love better or, or even resolve personal misunderstandings better. There, I think the crucial thing is to know very exactly what it is you want to say, which involves a certain introspection and familiarity with your own preferences, desires, and uh, emotional life, and I'm not obviously dealing with that in this course. Is the purpose of presenting contrasting views partly to defeat the opposing view? If so, is the presentation most effective when you do present opposing views? Well, I would say a presentation is uh, effective when you present opposing views, but here we have to be careful what we mean. The purpose of presenting contrasting views is not primarily polemical, that is, not to refute them but to make clear what you are actually saying, what the content of your view is. And this uh, derives from a basic fact of concept formation. 
all conceptualization consists of differentiating one group from everything else. On the most simple level, when you form the concept table, you say it's this and this and this, and you name several objects as against. You point to chairs, uh, pianos, beds, and so on. If you didn't have the contrast, you couldn't form a concept. A concept is an integration of concretes which you have isolated from their surroundings by contrast. Now that applies throughout dealing with concepts. This is one reason why you have to define a term. The definition consists of saying, I mean this rather than that. When I say man, I mean rational animal as against, you know, the various other types of animals. It equally applies to if you are saying you should bring up your children objectively. And you say that means refer to reality. That's a very broad abstraction. You have to, in a, in a mini way, go through what kind of facts are you distinguishing that from? What would it be not to refer to reality? Unless it's on such a simple level that the audience knows. Uh, if you're talking on the simplest level, there's no problem. But when you get to objectivity, rationality, selfishness, in other words, the kind of concepts that are philosophical, one way, one essential way of making clear what you mean is to say what you don't mean. Now, this has to be done with the appropriate brevity and in terms of essentials. There is a philosopher who is the reductio ad absurdum of this point, and that's G.E. Moore, who says, I'm parroting, but this is in effect it, uh, there is a table in this room. By table, I do not mean, and then he lists, mathematical tables, uh, you know, uh, uh, every possible kind of table that you can think of. He says, by room, I don't mean broom, even though the four letters are the same, and he goes on and on and on, and it becomes it's beyond comedy into farce, because he is busy differentiating what is obvious at the outset. So I don't, you don't have to make a song and dance where none is necessary. But when you deal with broad abstractions, some passing reference. If you deal with objectivity, you have to say, the facts as against the arbitrary content of the subject, like it's his feelings, his desires, his whims. Go by a reason as against faith or acceptance without any uh, evidence. Treat him as an individual, not as an indistinguishable member of an undifferentiated mass. You see what I mean? Even in writing, you'll see that in good writers will very frequently say, the point is not A but or B but C. Uh, I may have a tendency to overdo that. I don't even say that necessarily proudly, but just factually. Because you're so eager to say, I don't mean this, I'm setting off what I'm saying from uh, that other idea. If you don't incline to do that, it's a very helpful thing to do. It is not so much that you are refuting or attacking a different theory as indicating what you actually mean by yours. You're saying, I mean this rather than that. And that is a very important thing in all uh, uh, presentation. Now, if you're very good, you can present the opposing view in such a way that it's both clear and obviously bad at the same time, so you get a polemical smack in at the enemy for the same price. If you can do it without confusing the audience, that's okay. You know, you can say, by objectivity, I mean perceiving the facts rather than going on a drunken orgy of emotions without, you know, et cetera, et cetera. If you can do that, okay, but don't do it to the point where the audience doesn't know what you're talking about. The primary purpose is clarity, not polemics. Would you repeat and clarify the two traps one can fall into in defending ideas today? Yes, I put it more broadly. I avoided putting it in its real way because it was a point we did not discuss in this course, 
but I, in the question period, I can uh, do it briefly. There are three main schools that are applicable in this context, only one of which is the objectivist school. The intrinsic school, the subjective school, and the objective. Now, half of you look baffled and half of you look bored, so uh, <laughs> that gives me a, a problem. But to indicate, the intrinsic school is, in essence, the religious type of school. That is, that's its outstanding example. The truth is revealed by God. There's no question of argument. There's no question of beneficiary as far as ethics is concerned. You have duties that you ought to do, period. They pose as the defenders of objectivity against the subjectivists who say everything is a matter of opinion, do whatever you feel. They claim you should benefit by your actions, but the benefit has to be judged according to your arbitrary emotions. Now, most people think it's either or. Either you're the beneficiary, in which case it's deuce is wild, or you do your duty, in which case you're objective. They have no such category as the objective, distinct from both these other approaches. That is what you have to watch out for. Therefore, if you say there is objective truth, in most contexts, you have to, or in many contexts, you have to say, cover the point, and man lives on earth and should enjoy his life. And if you say man lives on earth and should enjoy his life, in most contexts, you have to say, but he can do it only by using his mind, and facts are facts, there are objective truths. Because these two other schools have so monopolized the field that most people, even not hearing them, and not knowing about them, if they hear, repudiation of one automatically assume the other. Now, for a more detailed presentation, I'd have to refer you to Ms. Rand's writings or my course on that. Is it the case that some article can be good as both written and oral presentations? I was thinking of Ayn Rand's philosophy, Who Needs It?, which, although prepared for oral delivery, seem great as an article. Yes, there are cases if you have a sufficient ability or a, a genius where you can do it so that an oral audience can grasp it and you can print it intact. But it is a very difficult thing to do. Uh, I would not suggest you aim for that until you're expert at writing and expert at speaking, and then you can word things in such a way that it has the brevity and terseness of writing and the clarity of speaking. It's very difficult to do. Uh, you said last week that audiences are sympathetic. Have you ever spoken to what you thought to be a hostile group and won them over? Uh, the only example I can think of uh, of a hostile group was this talk that I gave uh, years ago at uh, Berkeley, uh, University of California. Uh, and. Um, Actually, it turned out to be a very nice audience. I had thought at the beginning there was going to be trouble because there had been some leftist group, I don't know which one offhand, I don't remember, but they apparently had had some prearranged plan. And about five minutes after I got into the talk, throughout the hall, kind of by prearrangement, people started to get out and walk out in clumps. And I found out later that this was a uh, prearranged plan and apparently fairly common to make it appear to see that the talk is a failure and the audience disdains uh, this viewpoint. But uh, it didn't have any effect. Uh, the majority stayed. Uh, they did not seem particularly sympathetic at the beginning. And I liked them very much at the end. Now, whether you call that winning them over, I'm not sure how many of them were really enemies. I have seen a much better example of that, though, which was Ms. Wren spoke at Columbia University. Um, what was that talk? America's Persecuted Minority, Big Business. That was the talk. You may have read it. In which uh, her theme is contained in the title, and it was an attack on the antitrust laws. The audience was really hostile at the beginning. They were hissing uh, her as she spoke. Uh, and uh, she simply got more, how shall I put it, intense. <laughs> <laughs> and she made it clear that she was not intimidated by this. And they settled down and they got 
uh, quite quiet and attentive during the middle. And uh, uh, they began to listen, really listen near the end. And she got a very big hand at the end, a sustained hand. And there's the one case I can remember clearly of a very hostile audience who ended up being uh, seemingly quite friendly. I, I never have seen it quite in that dramatic a form. Why did you say writing on epistemology is tricky? <laughs> That's an axiom. <laughs> Because epistemology is an extremely difficult uh, field, you have to conceptualize the evanescent, intangible, ephemeral workings of the mind and put your finger on distinctions between things which are entirely within consciousness. And it's extraordinarily difficult to do and to present in an objective way that other people will recognize. Because in, a, in normal writing, you can point to the outside world as your reference. But in epistemology, you're talking about things like concepts, percepts, uh, mental integration, discrimination, uh, isolation, a whole bunch of things that take place only in consciousness. And even to make clear what you're talking about is extremely difficult. That's one reason. Uh, plus, so you're also turning the spotlight of your mind on your mind while using your mind. The whole problem, one of the problems of the epistemology is you have to think and observe yourself thinking. And it's an extremely specialized, technical, uh, treacherous endeavor. Metaphysics is a laugh a minute compared to <laughs> epistemology. That's, no, that's true. Now, there's one I'll, I have to answer. It's, it's long, but the answer is brief. In lecture two, you said, if you do not know what you are doing, you will not be too active. Therefore, you will not be too happy. That was by way of explaining a certain progression in the West Point article. Then the question says, this is incomplete. I submit as evidence Washington, DC, where far too many politicians do not know what they are doing are much too active and therefore make all of us very unhappy. <laughs> therefore, he suggests instead it should be you must recognize that you don't know what you're doing. Once you know that you don't know what you're doing, you won't be too active and therefore you won't be too happy. Do you agree? Yes. <laughs> or to put it another way, Ms. Rand wrote that paper addressed to an honest audience who would immediately infer, if they didn't know what they're doing, that that would make them be not too active. If it was the kind of audience who would conclude from not knowing what they're doing, and therefore they should act with redoubled zeal, <laughs> that would not have been an appropriate talk for that audience. Now, this questioner goes on, how would you refute the following? If your loved ones are worth dying for, what good to them will you be dead? Well, the answer is, what, what, why are they worth dying for? What is the, the threat? Now, uh, this would be appropriate if you said, uh, my wife uh, wants a, a blouse from Saks. And in order to achieve this, I'm going to throw myself in front of that truck because I can't wait to get across the street. <laughs> well, what good will, the, you know, it's appropriate. But it was, this con comes up in the context of uh, life in a free country, presumably, and a military invasion, or some such situation as that. Uh, in the case where they would be worth dying for, it would be because the alternative would be they would die, all of you would die, or all of you would be enslaved, or in some fatal way, wounded or harmed. And in that case, that's perfectly obvious. You decide you don't want to live if someone who matters to you to that extent has uh, his life or well-being uh, in jeopardy. You're perfectly aware you won't be any good to them dead, but you've decided their life under the conditions and any other conditions is not acceptable to you. So I don't, there's no, you're not defining what the, the uh, situation is where that would come up. I'll take some oral ones. I have some from last week, which I'm going to 
cover, but if there are some oral questions, I'd be glad to take them. As long as you don't pick on the second paper. Yes. Uh, last week you mentioned that there are varying degrees of reality, but not of existence. And I'm, I'm uncertain. I think that's what you Well, I better correct it. You said last week I said there are varying degrees of reality, but not of existence. Well, put that away, I would never say that. I made a statement which, do you want me to clarify that? Yeah. I said the term reality is used in such a way that you can in many times speak of degrees of reality. That doesn't mean metaphysically there are varying degrees of reality. You know, as though, uh, I don't know, the Earth is completely real and Venus is only partly real. <laughs> all the way down or something like that. That was Plato's viewpoint, not that example, but that type of view. Certainly, objectivism does not subscribe to that. I said only, you know, there are many cases where reality and existence are synonymous, where you can use reality, existence, the universe, and so on. But there are cases where you can make a linguistic distinction. In such a case, reality, and it has to be judged by the context, designates Real, uh, existence as perceived by a human being. And therefore, to you, for instance, if you've never uh, discovered uh, philosophy, you may hear an argument as to why philosophy is necessary to save the world, and you sort of get it, but we would say, it's not very real to him, right? It exists. You know the proof exists or whatever, but it's not real. It doesn't encompass that much. It actually, it means you haven't integrated it to that much in your own mind. You haven't connected it to that much. And therefore, to you, it's partly a floating abstraction disconnected from other things. Whereas, if you spend years learning why philosophy is necessary, uh, so on, it becomes fully real to you. It just terminologically, you, you can say not fully real, fully real. You can't say fully exists or not fully existed. It is or it isn't. In that sense, the terms are different, but it doesn't mean you can say there are degrees of reality metaphysically. Does that clarify? Yes, it does. Okay. Somebody else? Yes. The question that you read before about um, putting a, a loved one's life ahead of yours, whatever, the um, situation where that comes into my mind is that, uh, say, you were in a fire and you, you were a parent and you got the kids out for yourself and you knew that you were going to die for the kids and how do you, is that justifiable? Well, you're asking me an ethical question and I'll have to, of necessity, be brief because I, I can better refer you to an article. You're saying uh, how can you, uh, presumably as an advocate of selfishness, justify risking your life to save that of your children in a burning building? And the answer is very simple because Selfishness in the full context has to include the defense of all the values which you rationally regard as essential to your life and happiness, rationally. You have to have a hierarchy of what your values are and under what terms you propose to live, not arbitrarily, not subjectively. You couldn't say, well, the people in Tibet mean so much to me that I'm going to sacrifice for them no matter what, because you couldn't validate that objectively. But let us argue that you certainly could validate objectively that your children are that kind of enormous value to you. you. If you had children rationally to begin with, you would have them only because you decided that that was a crucial purpose of your life and then their birth and so on would make them such enormous values uh, to you that you could absolutely justifiably say, I would do anything to keep them alive. I don't choose to live on any other terms. This is analogous to Galt saying, he would kill himself rather than let them torture Dagny because he wouldn't care to live on such terms. Now, for the detailed discussion of that, you should read the objectivist ethics, specifically the ethics of emergencies, because uh, in that article, uh, Ms. Rand discusses at length uh, that very point. Um, here's a question from uh, last week. Uh, often a reader or a listener will be unconvinced by a presentation on first reading or hearing. He will have to check the content against his other knowledge. What implications does this have on adhering to the principle of objective communication? I don't know any principle other than adjust your pace accordingly. 
If it's new and you know it's controversial, give them time. Or acknowledge objectively. This is something you have to think about. So I don't expect you to agree now, go home and think. And then he says, for example, a writer or a speaker might want to make sure the audience stays motivated even after reading or listening so that the audience will go back to the material. How does one leave such a lasting impression on the audience? For instance, does one need a powerful motivating ending? Uh, there's no special rules for leaving a lasting impression. That has to be done by the quality of the talk and the impact of your delivery. If there was some one way to leave a lasting impression, you can be sure it would be worth its weight in gold, but it, there's no such way. The closest you can get is to tell them it'll be on the exam. <laughs> um, when communicating on a philosophical topic to a lay audience, how much can one reasonably expect the audience to be convinced on a first reading or a listening? On a first reading or a listening to a lay audience, if it's not a point they're familiar with, you cannot expect it. Philosophy is a time-consuming thing. It takes a lot of rethinking if you're changing your ideas. The most you can expect is that someone would be intrigued by your presentation. It would give them something to think about. They would say, gee, there's something there worth exploring further. But uh, you cannot expect to convince people of a controversial philosophic point uh, on the first hearing, unless there's some very special uh, circumstances. Uh, here's one. What is the value of learning via the spoken word versus the written word? That is, what benefits can one receive by listening to an oral presentation, especially when comparable written material is available? Or to put it another way, what benefits can the speaker convey to his audience in oral presentation that the audience cannot acquire from equivalent written material. Two things, really. Uh, when you say equivalent written material, I assume it's got all the same examples and so on, which, by the way, would not be common because usually written material is much terser and more abbreviated. But suppose uh, we made it, you have the exact same words written out as opposed to delivered orally. What is the value of oral presentation? Well, the value of written, of course, speaks for itself. The person has it before him, so he can set his own pace, retain it, etc. The value of oral is twofold. One, you can adapt the presentation to him. That is, the speaker can add or subtract. Uh, that's the issue of tailoring it to your audience. And there's no way to foresee that in the concrete case in advance. You can't foresee the exact degree of boredom or confusion or exhaustion or and so on that will need a pause and elaboration. And therefore, uh, you can make it easier in oral, even if you have the same script. Second is liveliness or color. Keeping people awake is much easier in an oral than written because you're there in person, there's a live person, they can look you in the face, and they can be obviously playing for a laugh, and they can, you know, at the spur of the moment, put in a joke or whatever is needed, they can yell or they can pause, anything to pep it up and bring it to life, which uh, in writing you're committed once you go with it. Uh, what do you think about practicing one's oral presentation in front of a mirror or before a friend? Okay, if uh, you don't memorize it. Uh, I actually use a wall, or used to use a wall when I first started, because it gives you no response at all. <laughs> it's completely inert. And therefore, you get used to the idea of talking and have absolute dead lack of responsiveness. And therefore, if it happens before an audience, you're not panicked. Whereas if you look into a mirror, you still expect some kind of feedback, and then when the audience looks at you in that glazed way, you're disoriented. It's good practice, but 
if you're trying for an extemporaneous presentation, don't do it to the point where you have committed to memory, because then you're losing uh, the value of the presentation. When a speaker is pedantic, is it because he is ignoring the differences between oral and written presentation? It might be, but that wouldn't be the commonest. I think the commonest is probably that he is a professor. <laughs> uh, pedantry is needless technicality. And you can do that in speaking or uh, in writing. And consequently, I couldn't list he could be a show off. Uh, he could be too lazy to make it simple. That could simply be the way he was brought up. It would be hard to say. There's many uh, possibilities. I'm going to stop a little early this evening, so let's uh, conclude at this time, and we'll pick up again next week. Thank you. This course continues on Lecture 6, Disc 1.